seated, friends. So on behalf of uh, Pauline's family, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming to support and comfort and encourage them uh, today in their time of loss. The Bible book of Psalm tells us that the span of our life is 70 years. But it goes on to say, or 80, if one is especially strong. It's interesting in the footnote of that scripture that some translations use the term special mightiness. Now I think I can speak for all in attendance. We knew Pauline, she was a very special person. Um, in speaking, with uh, some in the congregation, very kind words to describe her. But they never described Pauline as being a mighty person. When we think of someone who's mighty, we might think of a soldier or someone in authority. Pauline was kind. She was a humble person. She was generous. She was never self-centered. She always showed interest in others, great interest in her family, great interest towards those in the congregation. I uh, personally knew Pauline for 20 years, and in talking to some of the older ones in our congregation who knew her intimately, they all had one common expression, two common expressions about Pauline. First of all was her smile. You could see the joy in her heart when she smiled, and she was always happy to talk to you and happy to see you. Another thing we can all agree on is the way Pauline dressed. <laughs> she always looked good. And I mean, I saw her shoes and her necklace there. That's Pauline. She set such a good example in dressing in a dignified way. Even in her older years, she always, she always wanted to look good. Yes. Going back to mighty, was Pauline mighty? She was, not only in her will to live, making it to the ripe old age of 102, that's remarkable, but she was mighty in her devotion, in her spirituality, her dedication to her God, Jehovah. 
She was baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in 1956 and remained faithful right up until her death. I, uh, I can remember Pauline in her 90s in our congregation. She submitted an application for auxiliary pioneer service. So I know many of you are not familiar with what this is, so I'll just explain it briefly. <clears throat> In our organization, we're, we're known for our public ministry, going door to door, talking to people about the Bible. Past uh, couple years with the pandemic, maybe you've gotten phone calls from, from some of Jehovah's Witnesses. But we have this uh, provision for auxiliary pioneer service. And Pauline, well into her 90s, submitted an application in this regard, which would require her to put forth an extra 30 hours to reach that goal. So in looking at this application, I remember, well, and discussing it with a few others in the uh, congregation, is she in a position to do this? You know, she, she's quite elderly and, and uh, we, we talked with her and she was determined. She goes, I wanna do this one last time before I die. And she did it. She did it with the help of Sorry. <laughs> she did it with the help of those in the congregation. Her good friends, Mel and Jean Kennard, were by her side. She wasn't driving. Her mobility was limited, but she did it. Ecclesiastes 7.1 says that a good name is better than good oil, and the day of death is better than the day of birth. Pauline re is remembered for her good name, not only with her friends and family, but the name that she made with her creator, Jehovah God. So why are we here today? Well, no matter how old, how sick someone is, we all need comfort in a time of loss. And grief is a normal reaction when we lose someone close to us. How can we console one another? How can we help one another in the days ahead with this, this void that's been left? Let's look to God's word for some direction in that regard. Uh, the account in John eleven twenty three 23 to 26. Now, just to give you a little bit of background information on, on what's happening here, uh, a man named Lazarus has died. His sister Martha is grieving. Lazarus is also a very good friend of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, Jesus did not make it there before Lazarus died. Let's read uh, John eleven twenty three to 26. Starting in verse 23, it says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who exercises faith in me, even though he dies, will come to life. And everyone who is living and exercises faith in me will never die at all. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus asked her. So how did Jesus provide comfort? He gave her hope. Hope that she would see her brother once again. And when would this resurrection occur? Just in verse 24, uh, Jesus makes it very clear on the last day. Pauline held this same hope very close to her heart in her study of the Bible. So how else can we comfort one another in this time of grief? Well, let's uh, continue reading this same account go a little further. Uh, and, and just to uh, uh, set up the account, uh, what's going to happen is everyone is, is sad. They're weeping. They're in grief. Uh, Jesus is momentarily going to resurrect Lazarus. But notice his reaction, how he reacts to the situation with all this emotional pain. In verse 33, it says, uh, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping he groaned within himself 
and became troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus gave way to tears. Weep with those who weep. Our kind gestures, our expressions can go a long way in helping those dealing with a loss. God also provides comfort in our time of loss. Psalm 34 and 18 tells us that Jehovah is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The question is, how does God do this? How does he comfort and, and strengthen us? How does he draw close to us? Well, he's given us his word, the Bible, which is a perfect guide. Jehovah is a God of wisdom, justice, love, and power. And death was not part of his original purpose for mankind. Death is a result of Adam's disobedience. And all Adam's descendants have inherited this sting of death. Romans 5 and 12 makes that very clear. It says, that is why just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because they had all sinned. The Bible teaches that, and Pauline firmly believed that there would come a time when death would be a thing of the past. One of Pauline's favorite scriptures and one that she specifically wanted read at her funeral service is Revelation 21 verses three and four. So let's honor her wishes and, and read that scripture together. That's Revelation 21 verses three and four. It says, with that I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, the tent of God is with mankind and he will reside with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. That's the Bible's promise. Neither will mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be anymore. The former things have passed away. So the Bible gives hope to millions, countless millions who have died in the past that there, uh, there will be a resurrection, that the dead will live again. How is that possible though? Death seems so permanent, so final. Well, the resurrection hope is made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Matthew uh, 28, or Matthew 20 and 28 tells us just as the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life as a ransom in exchange for many. Christ's resurrection provides that guarantee that is available for all of us. Just in line with that, John 5 and 28 says, do not be amazed at this for the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice. Whose voice are they going to hear? Jesus Christ's voice. Jehovah has appointed Jesus to be in charge of the resurrection. So why do we gather in this house of mourning? How do we benefit from being here today and just reflecting on these few scriptures and uh, sharing precious moments of Pauline's life? Well, a, a funeral reminds us of how brief life is, how uncertain it is for all of us. Uh, death is very much a reality. In this present time that we're living in, death faces us all. So it makes us think, how am I using my life right now? What am I doing right now? Am I making a good name with my God? It's something for all of us to consider. How do we make a good name with God? That's, that's a good question. Well, Jesus alluded to this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. He told us to store up treasures in heaven. How do we do that? How do we store up treasures in heaven? Well, 
by our zealous works, by our godly conduct, by living according to Bible standards, we share in bringing praise and honor to the true God, Jehovah. This is what Pauline did for 66 years of her life. And those who do likewise can be certain that they will soon see their resurrected loved ones. The resurrection hope provides an incentive to uh, learn about God, to learn about the Bible, to do his will. And uh, occasions like this, we should reflect on that and uh, use the time that we have today to comfort one another in this loss. But we can also remind one another of the uh, precious hope that Pauline had. Just in conclusion, and one last scripture that I'd like to read, and this is once again one that Pauline specifically wanted read at her funeral service. It's uh, a brief scripture, but it makes us stop and think. It's uh, Psalm 37 and 29. It says there, the righteous will possess the earth and they will live forever on it. We prayerfully look to Jehovah for that future time and give us the needed strength in the days ahead until he can provide the permanent relief of this sting of death. So it would be fitting now, friends, if we uh, said a brief prayer uh, at the conclusion. Jehovah God, uh, our loving creator, we uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, uh, be together as friends and family of Pauline's as we uh, reflect on her life and her great devotion and the great respect that she had for her. Uh, we, we can uh, be nothing but happy to see the way she led her life. Uh, both her and her husband, uh, Johnny, were so well respected in the community uh, nothing, nothing but good has been said about their family. We uh, think, too, of the pain, the emotional loss that the family is going through. Uh, even at her advanced age, uh, it leaves a void, a place where she no longer exists. May your uh, loving arms of comfort be around them. May you comfort them uh, uh, by your Holy Spirit. May, may we, by our words and actions in associating with each other, as well, bring comfort to the family. Uh, we thank you for your word, the Bible, the hope that it gives us for the future, for the resurrection. We uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, being able to understand this as well, uh, the, the perfect pattern that your son set uh, for us to follow. May we do our best to live up to your expectations, to make your heart happy, and, and to uh, gain a good name with you. May we be uh, patient until we can wait for this uh, time of restoration and resurrection. We thank you for all the good things that you do for us. Please do forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, we ask this now. Amen. So friends, we're just going to uh, briefly listen to one of uh, Pauline's favorite songs. And then we are going to uh, turn things over to our funeral director who will uh, guide us through the uh, rest of the program.
Hello, I'm Kara Ashworth. I am the funeral director today. I would like to call up Devin Dion to do the eulogy now for Pauline. Good morning. For those of you who do not know us, we are Pauline's two granddaughters, Deb and Dion. Where do you begin to celebrate a life? The life of a little girl with big dreams, a loving daughter, sister, a young woman falling in love, a devoted wife, farmer, mother, auntie, friend and neighbor, a woman of strong faith and our grandma. Pauline was all of these things and more. Her life began in 1920, just as the Spanish flu pandemic was drawing to an end. She was born Pauline Christine Marie Daniel in her grandparents' home in Taylor Ridge, Illinois, to her loving parents, Paul and Clara. She was actually delivered in the same room and by the same doctor as her mother. The next year, their little family of three moved to Canada and settled in the Hearn and Avonlea district to start the farm that still operates today. In the following years, Pauline was joined by five siblings, four brothers, Ray, Henry, Carl, and Walter, and her sister Pearl, better known as Sis. The family worked hard and became vital members in their community. Pauline cherished her memories of her childhood. About eight years ago, Dion gave Grandma a book titled My Grandma, Her Stories, Her Words, so we could record some, so she could record some of her favorite memories. The pages are filled with entries describing a close family, a happy childhood, friendships, and community. She also speaks through the pages of growing up with strong morals and a deep respect for her elders. It was a time when manners, hard work, a tidy home, loving family, and deep ties to the community were valued and strived for. One entry reads as follows. The house I grew up in has many fond memories of happy times when we were all together as a family. We had a wonderful neighborhood. There were lots of large families close by. When we were older, we'd get together and go swimming in some of the dugouts, much to the dismay of our parents. Our parents put on house parties where we danced late at night and had such good times together. Saturday was our time to go to Avonlea. Dad and Mom would shop for groceries for the week. We kids would get together with our friends and walk the streets, get an ice cream cone. Thought it was great. Leo Martins lived very close to us and we kids were always getting together. Lois and I were very close the same age. We started school together. Where one was, so was the other. We went to dances, used to dress alike. Oh, our high-heeled shoes. <laughs> we had wonderful parents, spent evenings at home playing games. Mom would always make candy or popcorn or cocoa whip with whipped cream on top. Yum, everything is so different today. Speaking of those high heels, I remember once when she was living in Moose Jaw, so 75 or maybe a bit more, she still had so many high-heeled shoes that she wore even in winter. She said they were a good grip for the ice and snow as the pointy heels dig in. <laughs> when there are six children in the family and lots of neighboring kids to chum with, they found their sh fair share of mischief too. A story that I had never heard until she gave me back this little book a few years ago described one such incident. After I read it, I asked her about it, and she just laughed and laughed with a twinkle in her eye and that mischievous grin that she would get. According to her description in the book, the incident goes like this. One bad thing I did that I didn't tell my parents about was the time Don and Lois Martins, our neighbor friends, and my brother Ray and I all got together, which we do many times of the day, running across the field to each other's places, which was only about five minutes. We decided to go over to a vacant house that my cousin Clarence owned. He farmed the land there. 
There were pigeons there and we really wanted to see if they had any nests with young ones in them. All the nests were up high on the ledges and we couldn't reach them. There was a big barrel with some white powder in it. We needed the barrel, so we turned it upside down to empty it, and then we stood on it to look in the nests. We went home all excited, but never told anyone. About two days later, we heard the news that Uncle John Martins, who lived a quarter mile north, found about 20 of his pigs dead in and around the vacant house. The powder we dumped out was grasshopper poison, and it killed Lois and Dawn's uncle's pigs. We were so scared and not a word was said. I think poor Clarence got blamed for it. I told my folks about it years after. Oh, kids will be kids. The same foursome got another good scolding when they dumped a snake in Clara's tub of rinse water one summer afternoon. Pauline and Lois, born only four months apart and joined at the hip through childhood, continued to be best friends all of their lives. In the book I gave her, Grandma wrote, Lois and I stayed together through thick and thin no matter what. We are both 94 years old and still talk and phone each other every day. We laugh, we talk and laugh over things we've done and we just live it all over again. Lois and I were so much alike in what we did and how we thought. She will always be my outstanding and best friend. After Grandpa passed away, Grandma made some trips to Los Angeles to visit Lois, and the two of them would drive all over L.A. in Lois's Mercedes. They must have been like the Thelma and Louise in their 80s. <laughs> and they may even have gotten into a fender bender, but the details of that particular incident we'll never know. Lois passed away just a few months ago, so their friendship truly spanned a hundred years. Pauline's youth spanned the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression of the Dirty Thirties. As she grew older, the childish pranks and playing with her cherished dolls turned to dreams of nursing, going to dances with her best friends, Lois and Ruth Martins and Allie Aikens, and finishing high school. At one of those dances, she spied a good-looking fellow with curly hair playing the banjo, and the rest, as they say, was history. That good-looking, banjo-picking young man was our grandpa, Johnny Miller, and the pair never looked back. They were married in 1940 in her parents' home. As the world was at war across the ocean, Pauline became a wife and then a mother to her two children, Marlene Clara and Larry John. I think I'm okay. <laughs> They worked hard to provide for their family. Johnny worked several jobs, often at the same time, over the next 10 years, while Pauline managed the household. By 1950, they'd saved up enough to purchase their farm just south of Hearn, where they lived together until 1994. While John continued to work full-time and farm, Pauline grew large gardens, canned and preserved food, helped raise pigs, chickens, turkeys, geese, and cattle. In fact, one day, Grandma had a run-in with a bull named Ringo. <laughs> Our cousin Mark and Grandma went to the barn, probably to collect eggs. Ringo was in the pasture, and Grandma reassured Mark if they don't make eye contact with the bull, they could make it directly to the barn. <laughs> Off they went, but Ringo started across the pasture to chase them. Grandma yelled, Mark, run. <laughs> Grandma cleared through the barbed wire at lightning speed, opened the gate for Mark and pulled him through, closed the gate just as the bull got there. We didn't know she could move that fast. <laughs> Johnny and Pauline made a happy life raising their children. She and her daughter Marlene had a close relationship, traveling, vacation, vacationing, and shopping. Oh, the shopping. <laughs> Grandma and Grandpa made many trips to Calgary after Marlene married and moved away. Grandma would always say that Larry was a handful, keeping her on her toes, and trust me, just two days short of his 80th birthday, he still is. He could always make his mom laugh and certainly inherited her mischievous nature. 
He was forever playing tricks on her, locking her in the broom closet and telling her she couldn't come out till she behaved, <laughs> hiding her pies before family dinners and teasing her. They spent a lot of time together over the years and had the bond that mums and sons have. While she spent most of her life caring for and fussing over him, he and his wife Judy were able to give that care back through her twilight years. Pauline was an amazing cook and she loved to bake. At harvest, I'm good. At harvest time, she brought meals to the field and they were always hearty with hot dishes, salads, buns, pie, and iced tea, the works. She went in the ditch one time, trying to keep the food dishes from sliding around in the truck, and then everything went flying all over, <laughs> including the pies, which ended up all over the windshield. <laughs> Poor Grandma. The family suppers she prepared over the years will always be remembered, not only for the delicious food, but the warmth, love, and laughter shared at their table a table that remains in the old farmhouse to this day. I'm not sure how all 12 of us and often more fit, but she could always make it work. In her mid-30s, Pauline was reflecting on, on her beliefs, values, and her spiritual journey by studying the Bible. In 1956, she was baptized a Jehovah's Witness and remained a loyal member of her congregation throughout the rest of her days. Her faith was a central part of her life, and Pauline and Johnny enjoyed close friendships with many brothers and sisters in the congregation over the years. Her very dear and loyal friend, Helen, <laughs> her very dear and loyal friend, Helen Steele, continued to visit Grandma faithfully right up to the until she passed. Helen, our family is so grateful for your kindness <clears throat> and devotion. As time went on, John and Pauline's family began to expand as Marlene and Larry grew up, married and started families of their own. Being grandparents to their six grandkids was a joy to both grandma and grandpa and they certainly were the best at it. Mark, Mardine, and Marlon, the sons of Marlene and her husband Bruce, grew up in Calgary. Larry Jr., Dion, and I grew up on the family farm that had previously belonged to Grandma's parents. Being just a few miles from Grandma and Grandpa's farm, we spent countless hours there, and Grandma's patience for her kiddies, as she called us, <laughs> seemed to have no limits. Trust me, I'm sure we tested them often. We have fond memories of baking gingerbread cookies, playing fox and chicks on the kitchen floor with our brother, who, of course, filled the role of the fox while Grandma kept her two little chicks safe under her wings. We played cards and set up a beauty salon where Dion and I would do Grandma's hair and give her facials. We loved all her potions and lotions, and she indulged us frequently. The best of our childhood memories were the summers our Calgary cousins would come out. We would all camp out on the living room floor at nights and spend the days playing in the trees, building forts and tree houses. Grandma would always bring out the best lunches and snacks. There was always cinnamon buns with icing in the freezer. And even though our midnight raids kept depleting her stock, she never said a word and there was always more. She never stopped thinking we were her little kitties right up until she passed, and in her mind we could do no wrong. Even though we were waging childish wars on each other in the trees, losing grandpa's tools, and just causing general havoc. That's a grandmother's love. While she never had favorites, according to her, we all knew she did. Well, at least Dion and I did. The boys were always a little extra spoiled, and our brother Larry was spoiled most of all. <laughs> always the biggest piece of cake or pie. <laughs> the only time I ever remember her getting mad at him was when he and our cousin Marlon were shooting birds with his pellet gun, and they killed some of her barn swallows. 
Even then, she couldn't stay mad at them, likely because she was remembering the 20 dead pigs we were talking about <laughs> earlier. <laughs> While we were going through the book, she filled out for us. We finally found confirmation in writing. Under the heading, What Were Your Favorite Pets?, she wrote, and I quote, You know who my favorite pet was, Larry Kim. <laughs> ha ha. I guess at 94, there was no point denying it. Even up through her 80s, Grandma would still ride around in the grain truck with her grandson and never wanted to come in. She absolutely loved harvest time. Grandpa and Grandma remained in their farmhouse south of Hearn until 1994. Tending the land and hard work was in their blood, and it was with mixed feelings that they moved into a house in Moose Jaw when Grandpa's health began to fail. They happily made their home together until Grandpa's passing in 1998 at age 83. Without her lifelong partner at her side, Pauline had to learn to take care of some things in life that had always been Grandpa's responsibility, and she quickly learned what she needed to in order to live independently. She moved into Mulberry Estates when it opened in 2002 and immersed herself into all the activities offered. She was a regular at card games, shuffleboard tournaments, exercise classes, and even held the title of Wee Bowling Champion for a time. Ever the competitor, she'd often tell me about being the only one who could still touch her toes in exercise class. <laughs> she remained there until shortly after her 100th birthday. Needing more care, she then moved to Crescent Park Villas and then ultimately to Providence Place where she lived out the remainder of her days under the care of the wonderful staff. Like her mother before her, Grandma faithfully kept a diary for over 70 years, and her diaries were often summoned up to settle questions of various happenings in the community, births and deaths, or how the crops ran in different years. Reading through the entries is like viewing the world through Grandma's eyes. They tell the story of a simple life, hard work, marriage, faith, farming and family. There is joy and laughter, as well as deep loss and sorrow throughout the pages. Those diaries are a love story, the love story of her family life. We love you, Grandma and Mom. Rest easy now. On behalf of the family, we thank you for spending time with us today celebrating Pauline's beautiful life, and we hope that you'll join us for the luncheon. Thank you. Now the family has presented me with a PowerPoint presentation, so we will watch that now in Pauline's memory.
On behalf of the family, I would like to invite everyone into our Harvey room for the luncheon today. I will ask that you remain seated while I present the family out, and then you guys can follow afterwards. Thank you for your lovely service.